All right. Welcome to another episode of Conversational Pace. I'm your host, Brett Hornig. I've got my co-host, Finn Melanson. Finn, what have we got today? Got the Craft CTM Ultra on board today. On deck, I should say. All right. Let's do that again. CTM Ultra Trail. Because if you only stop at Ultra, you've you've now eliminated zero of Kraft's lineups. <laughs> We've got the Kraft CTM Ultra Trail on deck today. Very excited. Yeah, this has been a, a very interesting shoe. Like, I think I've gone through all the emotions uh, over the course of running uh, in this one. I was going to say similar. I'm, I'm a longtime user and appreciator of Kraft Apparel. I'm, I'm looking at my closet behind our recording here and I've got a bunch of shirts, a bunch of shorts. This is my first time in their shoe technology. So this is a very exciting episode for me. Yeah. Yeah. This is actually, this is my, this is my third craft shoe. So like by the, by the standards of how long craft has been in the trail shoe game, I am, I'm like a veteran for craft trail running shoes. Little disclaimer before we get started, these shoes were provided to us by craft but we're under no financial obligation to say whether or not we like a product because we want to keep these reviews authentic and beneficial, beneficial for you. Nobody will get to preview or watch this footage before it gets published to YouTube. Uh, so with that being said, let's get on with the Craft CTM Ultra Trail. Yeah, this, this shoe, it gets slotted into the slightly more rugged side of Craft's Trail shoe lineup. They have the... CTM Ultra 2, which is their kind of gravel bike, slightly less rugged version. And then there's the CTM Ultra Carbon, which is that same shoe, just with a carbon plate to make it feel a little bit snappier. This is the CTM Ultra Trail. So it's non-plated and has a more robust trail outsole, as well as a little bit more structured upper to handle, you know, slightly more adverse conditions and more technical terrain. Mm. The shoe comes in at $175. My nine and a half, which, yeah, we did go down. I did go down a half size for the testing of this one. We'll get into that later. My nine and a half came in at 11.7 ounces. So definitely getting into the like trail chunk category, but I don't think the, it didn't, it didn't feel like an 11.7 ounce shoe when I was running in it. And a lot of that's due to the shape. Definitely something we'll focus on more yeah. as well. It's a 30 millimeter stack in the forefoot, 40 in the heel. So it's a pretty traditional classic 10 millimeter drop. And uh, that's definitely something that we're seeing less of in trail shoes today. In terms of the materials for the shoe, we've actually got a pretty classic open engineered mesh upper. It's funny how in the Nike Zagama video, uh, link to watch that right up here. <laughs> I talked about how I felt like gone were the days of kind of a simple classic open mesh upper. And here we are running in a shoe with kind of a simple classic open mesh upper with... <laughs> quite a bit of breathability. Um, there's some plastic overlays around the toe bumper into the midfoot. There is no, no plastic heel cup, so it's still flexible down here, but because there's just a little bit of added material around the back, it does give it more structure than past craft trail shoes. In terms of the midsole, it's one big old giant slab of UD foam, which is Kraft's own EVA blend. So, you know, it's pretty traditional EVA foam. You know, we're not looking super foams uh, in this shoe. And then the outsole is a very rugged two-piece in-house uh, kind of trail outsole. You know, these are like very beefy lugs. Uh, not really too many options or not too much ability for these to get, you know, ripped off or shredded because it's just one piece in the forefoot, another piece in the heel. Ben, how much running did you get in this shoe? I know we're probably going to talk about sizing later in the episode, which is relevant here. I got 66 miles in on this shoe, fell short of that 100-mile standard. It wasn't for lack of interest or lack of effort. 
I came in at a size. I, I, I ordered this shoe true to size. I'm a size 12, and I now believe in retrospect I should I should be an 11 and a half in a craft. I should size down about half a size, maybe even a full size, but I, I think about a half a size. And I know that that's super interesting because we were talking offline. You think you would go up half a size? Yeah, let's interested. let's dive into that a little bit more because I think that's you know super relevant to what we're talking about right now. So I went down the half size because it was recommended that I should because I was told the shoe ran a little bit long. For me, where I wear my size 10s, I don't think the shoe runs long enough to really constitute going down a half size. So if I were to buy the shoe again, I actually would have gone up to the 10 because lengthwise, while the nine and a half was all right, you know, my toe was nearing the front, you know, I probably still had a half size of space. I could feel my big toe rubbing up against the side of the toe bumper. Um, never caused any irritation problems or blisters or anything, but I could feel it and it's, it did bug me just enough where it did make me wish that I had that half size up. So I feel like if anything, the shoe might run about a quarter size long. And then just depending on how the shape of the shoe matches your foot, it's going to be worthwhile to swing in either direction. So, you know, for, that quarter size in your case, Finn, you know, that 11 and a half sounded like the better choice for that quarter size swing for me, I would have stuck with the 10. Um, so kind of with that knowledge, you know, size accordingly. Is that a, in your experience, is this a frequent problem across all brands where being true to size isn't always the safe bet when ordering a shoe? It's a, it's a new brand problem. You know, that's really what it is. You know, like craft is still very new to the trail and footwear world. You know, they're just going to have slight discrepancies with the sizing across some of their models. Ultra and Hoka were both the same way when they were getting into uh, getting into footwear. Uh, some of the first Ultra models, I remember at one point, the Ultra Superior, their slightly more minimal model. I had to I had to wear a full on like size eleven for it, but then their Lone Peak, nine or nine and a half, like it was crazy. And I've had the same deal with some Hoka's uh, back in you know like the two thousand nine two thousand ten type range. They'll iron it out, like it will it will get fixed, um, but it's just kind of like growing pains with most of these uh, shoe companies. Where'd you run in the shoe, Brett? So I got in 106 miles in the shoe, mostly all in the, you know, buffed out cruiser single track and dirt roads of Ashland. I did get to go on a couple slightly more like moderate technical trails. I also did get to test this shoe finally in some like properly wet and soggy conditions. I got to take this through some deep mud, uh, some slick mud. I got to run in snow. I even got to run on some icy roads to really see what the rubber compound was like. Um, so it, this was probably the most complete, um, complete testing for uh, terrain and weather that I got to take a shoe through so far. What about you? Standard Bonneville shoreline trail miles here outside of Salt Lake City. A couple of unique situations in the last week as I was working to get more miles on this shoe. Uh, Salt Lake has been going through apocalyptic level snowstorms and I took it on some snow covered sidewalks. So flat terrain as well. Just got back from a run actually earlier this morning. We're recording this in mid-December uh, where I was post holing an eight foot deep or not eight foot, eight inch deep snow. I mean, absolutely <laughs> incredible. What was interesting about that experience, though, is the shoe obviously got soaked. I completed that run maybe an hour ago, uh, had the shoe on after that, and this upper is almost completely dry now, which is fascinating to me. Like a little bit damp, but you know, the, there is that perp or there is that side benefit to a breathable upper. I feel like where um, you know, if you're running through puddles in a race setting, or you're out on like a long run and there's just inclement weather. Um, it can get back to dry relatively quickly, which I, which was a pro for me. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's a very open, breathable mesh. I mean, I think weather wise, you know, yeah, you're running through puddles. It's going to drain super well. This might be an excellent summer conditions shoe, uh, in super hot weather, um, or race scenarios where you're, you know, soaking yourself with water and, you know, the water's dumping down to your feet, you know, you're not going to get that long-term sponge-like feel. 
In terms of the fit, you know, we definitely already touched upon the length. Uh, width wise, this one was interesting. Uh, the other craft models that I've run in, I feel like we're a little bit wider than this one. Um, it is like pretty medium width throughout the heel and the midfoot, but then going towards the forefoot, I would say it is probably on the lower volume side and does get a touch narrow where, you know, if your feet are, you know, tipping towards that wider side, you might notice your toes touching this toe box a little bit more. Finn, how did you feel about the width of this shoe? I think you described it to a T. I do think it is one of the, for me, and I, I am someone with a wider foot, for a shoe that has a relatively athletic look to it, um, a slightly narrower look, it actually, similar to the Adidas uh, shoe that we were reviewing earlier this year, I did feel like I still fit into it pretty well. Um, my feet were able to display decently. And I think it did help that, at least from my perspective, the, the midfoot area was a little bit wider. And where I tend to get a lot of blistering in narrow type shoes is in that midfoot like arch area. So it was a good ride for me in that respect. Yeah. And I think part of that uh, added volume, you know, that craft tried to incorporate in the shoe was by having the lace eyelets not go down that far. Um, which does open up the forefoot a little bit more. It, on the other hand, though, for someone who does have a slightly narrow foot like me, it wasn't able to create a ton of additional security down below because we, you know, we only have one, two, three, you know, four main eyelets within that, and then the fifth bonus one. You know, most shoes are in that six, seven range. Oh, I just wanted to say one more thing. You know, we talked about this during the Ultra Mount Blanc review one of my criticisms with that shoe is just the way they constructed the tongue sort of into the sidewall of the shoe. There was just a lot of opportunity there for just like an abrasive feeling on the arch. And I, I don't know how you would describe this technology, but I feel like the material that they used to connect the tongue to the sidewall um, helped a lot too. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's a very large perforated foam. Uh, see if the camera lighting can get that. Yeah. So those are just giant holes with like a micro mesh sewn over it. So it's a very minimal, super floppy tongue, but there is a very thin layer that sews the tongue into the shoe, you know, wraps around the foot, a kind of a, like a, a booty type construction, as they say. Yeah. And that, you know, that it almost makes it feel like there's no tongue at all. Um, I do wish that it had a little bit more thickness because I got a few lace bites issues coming in super steep stuff so on my left foot in particular just on the medial side like right here um towards the top um one of the tendons across the top of my foot would get just a little bit pissed off on very steep descending the one thing i will say here to close up on that we've both run in the ultra duo before and i think one of our mutual criticisms of that shoe is sort of the formless tongue and how it can kind of just take shape however it wants once you have the shoe on and it's hard to maintain. I do feel like even though this is a relatively minimalist tongue, I feel like it does keep shape once you're in the shoe, which I think is critical, at least for me. I did like the fact that it didn't move at all, for sure. Um, moving to the heel fit, I did have some heel slippage issues the first few runs of the shoe. And I think that is due to this super rugged outsole greatly increasing the stiffness of the shoe, which ultimately led to a longer break-in period. You know, it was, I almost thought the shoe was going to be an immediate deal breaker the first run because my heel was slipping so much because there is foam sewn into the ankle collar, but not that much. I was worried that it wasn't going to be enough and my foot was always going to slip. But after a few runs, it actually did kind of take shape a little bit better and mold around the contours of my ankle. And after 20 miles, it ended up being a non-issue and has continued to be great ever since. Why do you think they do that in the ankle collar, by the way? Like if you were in the same room with those shoe designers, what do you think their rationale is? It is such a, I don't want to say a gamble because it's like, it's like a calculated gamble in terms of just how much foam to put back here. Cause too much, it'll push your foot forward. Your foot can move around you know, not enough and your foot might slip or you might get blister issues. So there's always going to be for every shoe a slightly different amount. Like a lot of the road racing super shoes don't even have any foam back there. They just have like two tiny little foam tabs that are glued in. Some of the more like 
luxurious, big, giant mileage shoes. Um, you know, even like like the Brooks Caldera have a lot more foam back there. But, you know, I think Kraft did intend for the shoe to have some speedy elements to it. So they wanted you to have a little bit more precise locked in fit, um, which would lead me to believe why they didn't add too much extra foam here. Interesting. In terms of moving on to the actual ride, you know, over the course of your running in the shoe, I know it was a little bit big, but how did you feel about the way it felt when you're out on the trail and the roads? Am I crazy to think that this shoe could be used in recovery scenarios? And I don't want to say this too early, but like I also, when we talk about like where I would use the shoe, I feel like I could use it in a hundred mile setting. So do you think I'm crazy to think that this could be used in those settings? You know, I don't think you are. I think it's going to come down to how much one appreciates the firmness of this midsole. There is a ton of foam here, but it's not very soft. Like it's, if anything, it's kind of hard, which off the shoe, like the reviews that we've done, you have tended to gravitate towards the slightly firmer shoes. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, and with that being said, if you appreciate that slightly firmer feel, but are worried that the firmer shoes, which are oftentimes always a little bit thinner, are going to pack out or start to putty out over the course of something really long. There is so much stack of slightly firmer foam here that I just don't see many race scenarios, hundred miles plus where you're going to, you know, kill the shoe in one effort. Um, especially with the one piece outsole actually will serve kind of as a, uh, a, a much more solid base to keep the midsole foam from packing outwards. Um, hmm. some of the segmented outsoles allow for that. Uh, but this outsole will kind of keep it all together. Um, with that being said, I thought the shoe was a little bit too firm for me for some of those long, yeah. easy, slow recovery efforts, because I, I like a, a, a mushier feel. Um, you know, this shoe was more of like my moderate trail days. I pulled it on the days where the weather was crappy and I needed that extra grip. Uh, the lugs shed mud really well. And mm. I thought because of that added stiffness and how much foam there is, it really does wrap up around the sides of the foot like a bucket seat. It ended up being a much more stable shoe than I thought, you know, 40 millimeters of stack height in the heel. I thought I was going to, I was nervous that I would roll some ankles, but yes, I only rolled one ankle and that was 100% my fault. That had nothing to do with the shoe. Um, the shoe Take was ownership. Yeah. The shoe is surprisingly <laughs> stable. Um, across a lot of different trail conditions that weren't good. You know, they were slightly more technical or muddy, some snow. And I, it gave me a lot of confidence on like pretty crappy terrain in the shoe. For what I'm interested in doing on trails, which is really anything from, let's call it the half marathon distance up when it comes to races and when it comes to workouts, those like long tempo type runs, I don't know a scenario where, I wouldn't exclude this shoe from consideration at the same time that you, know, you mentioned the word stability. I mentioned comfort and the feeling that like my shoe wouldn't get too, my foot wouldn't get too beat up if I took it out for like a super, super long day. I, I do feel like this shoe is incredibly versatile in a lot of different scenarios. Yeah, it's, it, it, it does kind of lend to that, you know, maybe Jack of all trades, master of none type uh, shoe where you know, a, a very, com an interestingly comparable shoe that I thought of was the Brooks Cascadia. Another shoe that's like kind of firm, pretty rugged, something that you might actually take like hiking or fast packing. Um, if you want like a lightweight hiker, I almost felt like this fell into that category because of how stable it was, how beefy it was underfoot. Where this shoe does get a little bit more confusing though is like you said, like running in it, like, yeah, like I could do, I could see myself doing a faster workout because this shoe is shaped like a Nike vapor fly. Like this is going to be Brett's hot take of the shoe review. It is shaped like a vapor fly. It's got the extra foam going behind the heel, which adds to that uh, kind of stability and smoothness of the roll. It has a very aggressive rocker. Like it's kind of a late rocker um, where it only starts like maybe at the forefoot or under the ball of the foot or a little bit later even. And so it really just like tips you forward. 
all the same ways a Vaporfly does, but this has quite a bit firmer foam. And as a result, it's significantly more stable. What are your thoughts on that, Finn? <laughs> it's a sexy shoe. And I think the Vaporfly is a sexy <laughs> shoe as well. Like I, I agree. And it's, that's why I say I can't take it out of consideration in any scenario because it makes me feel equally equal parts fast and equal parts uh, comfortable and stable. And uh, I think that's the right take, not just a hot take, but the right take, Brett. Yeah, it's it's like almost the vapor fly. It's almost I'm not going to call it the vapor fly of the trails because it definitely doesn't. The foam does not feel like a vapor fly. The shape, though, feels like a vapor fly. And that creates a dynamic in a shoe that I don't think I've ever actually had before. Like it's almost like a new feeling shoe to me. I would love to know the background of the designers. Like who did craft bring on? Where were they? Where were they in the industry pre craft that could tell us a lot. Yeah. I would be really curious to learn a little bit more about, yeah, the history of who made the shoe. Uh, I guess going a little bit more into that, you know, what did craft design the shoe for? And is that true? So reading right off the craft website, uh, they quote capable off-road or moderate to lightly technical trail surfaces and in varying climate conditions. Mm. I actually, I don't think I would change a thing. Neither would I. I. I don't think that that description, they could have, in my opinion, they could have just said all purpose. I, I don't see, it, I, I, it didn't sound like they excluded very many trail scenarios there, except for maybe like the steepest, most gnarly technical trails out there. Yeah. And I wouldn't wear this on the steepest, most gnarly technical trails, but for a little bit of technicality, I would absolutely wear this for dirt roads. I would wear this. I wore this on paved roads and it was just mm -hmm. fine. Um, the only thing I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do like really hard, super fast workouts just cause I would want something a little bit lighter. Um, but I feel like they actually, what they designed this shoe for was pretty spot on. So kudos to craft for making a shoe and advertising it the correct way. Yeah. Last, well, I guess second to last bit. Finn, did you like this shoe? I think I would have loved this shoe if it was sized perfectly. Mm. I liked it enough, even though it was too big to take it out for 66 miles. So mm -hmm. the fact that I had the enthusiasm to get it out the door, even when it wasn't a great fit each day, tells me that uh, if I was sized right, I might have tried to find excuses to pull this off my shoe rack even more often than I did. So um, I'm, I'm excited, you know, as we move into 2023, I am very excited to uh, experiment with more craft shoes. This is a fascinating brand to me. Yeah. And there's a lot of really exciting craft shoes. Uh in the pipeline for 2023 that we will get our hands on and do some, you know, put some miles in. I first few runs, I did not like the shoe at all. I was like, this is craft's worst shoe. Oh my gosh. I can't, my foot doesn't fit in it. A couple runs later started to work in a little bit better. This was probably the longest break in period for any shoe I've ever had. I, I have a hundred six miles on the shoe. I feel like it didn't start to hit its sweet spot until about 80 or 90 miles, which kind of leads me to believe that this shoe is going to last a very long time. Like it's just like now starting to feel good at a hundred miles. I could totally see myself getting, you know, 500 trail miles out of it, especially with this outsole rubber. I mean, hundred miles, taking it across some gnarlier trail, there's almost zero wear as well. You know, I don't, yeah believe the outsole rubber Same. is going to be a limiting factor at all. Oh yeah. You got, you got the snow shine. I got the snow yeah. shine. Yeah. yeah. Um, which brings us to the last section and that's the value $175 for the shoe. How do you, how do you feel about the kind of the cost of this shoe for what you get? I mean, it certainly doesn't surprise me. I'll be honest with you. When you told me 175, I've always been anchored to craft as this brand that is like the Ferrari or the Mercedes of the outdoor arena, whether I'm right or wrong, that was just my perception. I could have easily seen them in this era of $200 shoes, pricing it at like 225. So to me, I'm sort of anchored to that perceived high price point. 175 seems low to me, at least in the way that they think about branding and pricing. Uh, what do you think? 
175. So yeah, I can definitely see you're coming from the the influence of the super shoe and already yes. mentally having being fully adjusted to $250 shoes. <laughs> I am not, especially in the trail. So I think 175 is about the most that this shoe can get away with costing. Um, and I think where the majority of the value of the shoe comes from is in the super shoe shape, but with a Brooks Cascadia type durability. So mm. it's just something like this might be the only shoe where you can get a combination of those things and there is value there. So you're going to get a ton of, you know, ton of use, ton of mileage out of the shoe. And for such a unique shaped shoe, I think that's where a lot of the value lies. Um, I didn't see any spots on the shoe that I see, you know, failing anytime soon. I have no durability concerns or anything like that. So, you know, I think a lot of the value is going to come into the durability and the unique shape and ride that you get from the shoe. I could see myself getting five to 600 miles out of this shoe. Yeah. You know, it's something that it's something that you're going to be able to put on easily and just go running in. The last question that I wanted to ask you, at least to me, craft is relatively new to the shoe making scene. Where do you see, as they become more of a staple in this world, where do you see them fitting in? Like from a positioning standpoint, you have your ultras, your hokas, Nikes. Where, where does where does craft belong in the long term, in your opinion? With the shoes that they have released already, you know, relatively high stack, very smooth running shoes. You know, it seems like craft is making their entrance into the trail world from a training and racing standpoint uh, with shoes that are very comfortable to run in. You know, they haven't made something that's, you know, your super technical big mountain, like high alpine ridgeline terrain type shoe. They've made shoes that are meant for cruising long miles in relatively reliably, reliably as well as creating some shoes that you can go do some fast workouts in. So that's, that's where I feel like craft is at the moment. And with what their lineup for 2023 looks like, it seems like they're only going to lean into that more with some new foams, new shapes, still high stack height, you know, looks like they're trying to make some pretty like go long and go fast type shoes. Right on. Exciting times. <laughs> um, I think my calls to action for this episode are simple. Where was I so right? Where was I so wrong? Likewise for Brett, leave your comments in the comment section of this episode. If you've had experiences with the shoe, we want to hear from you. If you've heard about craft, we want to hear from you, but let's get this conversation started. Mm -hmm.